We're ready. Okay. Do what you got to do, girl. Get into it. I was trying to. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Boy, Girl, Mom, and Dad podcast. I am Lauren. And I'm Nick. And this is episode 46. It's going to be fine. Boy, girl, mom, and dad here for the good times and the bad. Gender norms and stereotypes to making sure that the butts are wet. Boy, girl, mom, and dad want grown up time. You're going mad. It's a trip, but we'll guide you through with tips and tricks for boys and girls, too. It is going to be fine. Yeah, this is somewhat of a love letter, not a love letter, maybe not even a hate letter, but this is basically talking about anxiety and specifically anxiety in parenting, but not just that because I think we all experience some sort of anxiety, but we're going to talk about not how to combat it. I'm just saying all the negatives you're probably you're disliking right now, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, you'll understand once we get into the episode, but that's kind of like the bedrock of the episode. But before we get into it, let's have a tiff. And Nick, I'm giving it to you today. Why do you always give it to me on the days that I'm not ready for it? Well, you tell me all the time when I take it that you're ready for it and you have one. Yeah, but you pre-think these out. And I don't have a list. Okay, give me a second. Neither do I. Okay. So mine is, I think we've done pieces of this before, but not zoomed out a little bit. Mine is done or perfect. Okay? Okay. So I'm not suggesting that we should be perfect. It should more be like done or structure. Here's my example. We've talked about the Tupperware drawer before how you don't like to stack the Tupperwares, right? You prefer to just put them in the drawer because done for you is getting them out of the way. The same thing happens with the silverware. The same thing happens with your shoes when you come in. So I'm curious because you sometimes spearhead organization in these areas. Like you were excited to do the shoe area and you were the one that was trying to tell us you know, shoes have to stay here. Inside shoes are here. Outside shoes are here. But when you come in, you drop your shoes in the middle of the room. So I'm I'm just curious. Like to you, I understand there's a lot going on. I'm not trying to criticize that by any way. But in my mind, it takes the same amount of time to take your shoes off and take them off and put them by the front door. Same thing with Tupperware. It takes the same amount of time to stack your Tupperware instead of just throwing it in the cabinet and creating a chaos situation. So I'm curious in your mind... Are you the done person or the structure person? I think the question is like done or done right in your mind. Sure. Done or done the way we have agreed we want it to be done. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. Without, but that's way too long. Yeah. It's it's weird because I don't know. I I hear what you're saying about the shoes. A lot of time it's just like I'm trying to survive down there with two, two and a half year olds running after me. And so I don't. So I don't have time. It's that honestly, I'm so spaced and not even myself as a person um, when I'm trying to like even accomplish one thing. So I get that. Um, And also, you've been more specific about taking our shoes off immediately. And so sometimes I'll I'll have tried to come up the stairs and um, put the shoes there, but you didn't like that. So I was trying to just take them off downstairs. I know that's lately. But it's also just interesting because... That to me is such like an easy thing to put away maybe at the end of the day. I see what you're saying about the Tupperware. So a lot of times it's just like not to say you're my way in the kitchen, but you're my way in the kitchen. And so I, I'm trying to put them in fast, quickly, which is not the answer to getting things done. But otherwise, it sets off a whole different domino effect of like if I don't take the stuff out of the dishwasher, then it's going to be there for me later. And then it's just going to create like a bigger pile. So I am thinking big picture. Um I'd say the Tupperware, even though it's not like perfect right now, I'd say it still looks pretty good. Um, Let's see. The other thing you said. Well, it's just also hard for me because I, for example, wanted to do redo like our little toy area downstairs. 
um, just to reorganize it. And there was stuff everywhere. And so you were helping one time. You just kind of like shoved it everywhere. And then it was like, that's what it looked like until like just a couple of weeks ago until I had a chance to go back through and do it. So I think when I think about doing something like as simple as shoes, that feels like it's not overwhelming to me because I generally will bring my shoes upstairs at the end of the evening and put them away or put them in our room. Um, But for sure, when it comes to like putting something away, I would rather leave it where it is until I have a second to organize and put it where it's supposed to go versus just shoving it somewhere that then it's going to create. It's off the floor maybe, but is more of a mess. I think this is just a very <laughs> out there <laughs> tip. And so I don't know if we're going to lose people on this, but do you have any comments on what I said? Well, it's interesting that you have anxiety about losing people because we're actually going to talk about anxiety and the, you know, a little bit of fear in today's episode. Um, but I think what I'm trying to suggest here is that when we have structures here, I think it would be best for both of us to hold fast to using them, even if it takes a little bit longer. And I am talking to myself here as well. For example, like now that you've beautifully reorganized the toys downstairs, I not only have a place to put them away, but I have a right place to put them away. And I'm not perfect in that, but I have been trying to do it. And I think we've both been able to keep that more organized. Yeah. What I'm saying is, and I, and that was not a point about how I am doing it perfectly. I that's one that example. Um, I think that you frequently choose, which you just said, the done option more than like the done the way we want it to be done option. And you already said it yourself because there's a chain reaction in your mind of possible terrible things that will happen if you don't just quickly get it done. But I think what you're not seeing is that there is you're like – investing in a later disaster if you're not doing it the way you and I have agreed to do it. And the exception here is like things we haven't already cleaned. Like for example, our nursery closet is a disaster. Neither one of us know where things go aside from maybe one or two suitcases, right? So like I have no reason to get annoyed with you for not putting something away in there because there is no away in there, right? But like my Tupperware area and the silverware and like certain things that I have tried to organize similar to how you've organized the toys, I feel like we do have new standards there and we should try and use them. And I think you'd be surprised that I wouldn't be frustrated if something took a little bit longer for you to like stack your Tupperware or stack. The I think, I think where it's hard, the kitchen is a really hard example for me because it is such okay. a used space. And if like you don't have it, usually you clean the kitchen in the morning after you make breakfast, but picture you, you, don't have a chance to. And so there's pots and pans in the sink and then the dishwasher's not emptied, which I try to do as like a gift, even though you hold the kitchen card. So that's not been emptied. And then now I'm like supposed to be working, but then like I'm about to put them down for their nap. And now the pot that I need to use is in the um, sink and I have to clean that. And then I need a spoon. Um, I forgot what I would need the spoon for, but imagine I need the spoon or I'm trying to put stuff away, like when I put them down for their nap, and I can't do that because the dishwasher is still clean and full of clean stuff. And so now I'm taking away the maybe 45 minutes that I have to do something because of the chain reaction that started in the morning. And so really, that's what I'm seeing in the kitchen is a really tough example for me, just okay. because of how used it is. That's fair. So let me ask you a question. If I had a really busy busy evening, was putting the kids to bed, was alone with them, had a bunch of work to do, many other things that sound similar to what you're saying, and I chose to clean up by just throwing the toys downstairs instead of in their organized bins anywhere they wanted to go, and you saw that in the morning, would that make you feel happy or not? I think that's not a fair example because I'm putting them where they go, but I'm not meticulously making sure the forks are right lined up perfectly like I've seen you do. So I think then you don't agree with the method to my madness is what you're saying. Because like there is a reason the Tupperware is stacked. It's not because I'm OCD and I want to see it perfectly stacked. It's because I don't want it to attack me when I open the door. But when and was I don't the last time it attacked you? Well, but right now, if I open it right now, there's like four or five stacks of like bigger things on top of smaller things. And I would have to pull all three stacks out to search for what I want. This happened yesterday. I think I... I, we already have to pull it out to search for it because of the st- thing stacked in the back. So I hear what you're saying. Um, and the silverware is stacked a specific way so it doesn't hurt, like stop the door from closing. Like if we just pile them up, the knives and the forks will get in the way of the door closing. So like and I, maybe it's just that you and I haven't talked about that and you think I'm just being OCD. 
but I'm no. actually, I'm trying to do something similar to what you're doing with the toys in other places. And it's not just but the I'm, kitchen, but that's I'm not my point. stacking the toys in a specific way and saying, dude, you can literally, literally just throw them into the basket. And oftentimes also about the dishwasher is the twins will help me unload it. And so that they're, they like sure. to put the silverware away. And yeah, no, I didn't have time to go back through and make sure all the knives were going the right way. So sure. I hear what you're saying. Um, I think that it's something that we'll have to keep working on. I'm not perfect in it either. And this is not a call out Lauren moment. No. But I think what I'm saying is we're getting to a point where we have things that are pretty well organized compared to the chaos that our life was six months ago. And I think we should take the extra second to try and make sure we're not making disaster investments. 100%. And um, something that I've been doing is like just cleaning an area as I can. And so like on Saturday, I cleaned up like our upstairs hallway and they had just been accumulating boxes and things and it looks so good out there. And so I think if you're in a similar stage as us, if like it feels overwhelming, which I, I never in my life until I had toddlers felt like I really can't just pick up that sock off the floor and and put it in the in the dirty clothes until I had toddlers. And now I completely understand the paralyzation people feel um, in doing things in something where I don't have it. I think is extreme that's represented in this book, but it's called How to Keep House While Drowning. And I I finally I think I understand like um, the depressed state of like cannot move and cannot function and cannot bear to even like I may walk past that clothes on the floor, but I can't pick it up. And so if you're in a similar state, I would just encourage you to try to do like one thing at a time. Like I did the downstairs. What else did I? Oh, I did our closet. Um, the other weekend, um, Nick had just put them to bed and he, I think he thought it was going to be like a chill Friday night. We we're going to watch billions. And he came in and I had uh, all of our clothes on the bed, <laughs> but it just like, You know, we moved into this place in 2021, no, 2020, um, and it was like we moved it all ourselves, and we've done a good job of going through all of our stuff, but it had just like piled up, man, and it's so nice now, but it took me a while to get to there, so just know I think you can get there, you will get there, and just do it like a piece at a time, and to the next point, the next, I think the next thing we need to do is in um, this room in the closet and kind of mess with that and make it a little bit better. What? Go ahead. This is, I'm not trying to get the last word. If you want me to edit this, I will push it back. But the closet is a perfect example of one that I should hold well to your new standard. Like you told me the other day, right? These empty hangers need to go in the middle now, which now that we have a system and it's organized, happy to do it. And I'm trying to do it. So me doing that for us is the same request I'm making for you in other areas. I think what I'm hearing you say though, about like the, the, um, forks and knives and then the Tupperware is like, I'm not, I don't even care if you put the hangers the opposite way I have them, or if it's like one is stuck up and they're not like perfectly lined and perfectly spaced. And I feel like that's what I'm hearing you ask of me is that the forks, cause I've seen you do it and you're like meticulously line up the forks. And so right. I think that's where it's different for me is like, I'm just like, put the hangers in the middle. I don't care what they look like. It can be opposite. It can be wonky. It does not bother me. And what I think I'm... that's a little bit the, where the difference lies. I'll cut that. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, That's okay. I understand what you're saying. What I'm telling you is that it's not ridiculous. There's a method to the madness. So the hangers facing the opposite direction impede my ability to quickly pull them out and get on with taking care of the twins and whatever else I'm doing. Like there's, no, It may seem ridiculous to you because you're not the one that is considering that specific system the way you are, like the closet or the toys or the whatever else you have taken to organize. But what I'm asking for is you to think that I'm not crazy and to be okay with trying to hold the same structure that I think works well for us. If you want to challenge like, Hey, I don't really care about this. Why is this important to you? We can talk about that. But like, instead it feels like you're just disregarding it because it's not important to you. Yeah, I get that. Um, I definitely am like a why person. I like to know why. And actually I know this is going on, but I think it's a, this, this tip is drawing out, but I feel like it's a good dialogue. Yeah. Um, See, it's a good one. I did never understood, and it almost kind of bothered me how you don't ever use the key fob for our car. You go and touch. We have like this sensor and like the touch handle on the door, but I didn't realize like that when you do that. For me specifically, I should start doing that because I just always use the key fob because why not? I can do it from far away, but it knows my um, profile if I touch it. 
and it, it, like you make sure that it's like your profile, so it's your like seat arrangement, and all of that. Whereas if you just use the fob, it's not guaranteed that it's going to be your profile. So I just didn't realize. I thought it was just like you liked using the technology. I'm like, come on, I'm I'm at the car before you. Can you just use the key fob? <laughs> if I didn't have mine, I have to wait for you to come and like put your hand on the door. Um, but but I understood that the other day, and it wasn't because you told me. I had never even asked you about it because like it wasn't worth it for me to bring it up, even though it was annoying to me. Um, but I understood. I was like, oh. I wonder if, because I, I went out there by myself and I could use the fob. I was like, it's under Nick's profile, not mine. But yeah. I, I turned off the car or I got out of the car, locked it and touched my hand. And lo and behold, it was my profile. And I was like, that must be why he does it. Um, yeah, that's a good example. And yeah. I, and I, by the way, I'm not telling you like blindly follow everything I do. But if what I, I am won't. saying, I think is, yeah, what I am saying is like, if you don't understand, feel free to ask. And that's not going to be upsetting to me. Like, and if we agree, Hey, that's a ridiculous thing. That's not important for us to spend extra time on. That's fine. You know what I mean? But like, at least try and find out if there's a method to the madness. Yeah. And I, I, I love to ask why. And, um, I feel like with the silverware drawer specifically, what impedes me from opening it is just, we actually need to clean out the silverware drawer and take some of the stuff out that's on the side. It's never been like the forks and knives and stuff for me. And it's the Tupperware. You're right. It doesn't bother me. I mean, I would dream of like one of those Tupperware, like organizers you put in and it's like, this is where the lids go and stuff. Um, but I think I'm just used to it because that's how like my parents Tupperware drawer is. And so I'm just like, eh, it's just life. It's kind of a fun surprise. Is it going to hit me in the head when I open the door? I don't know. <laughs> First of all, that's a hilarious de definition of fun. Uh, second of all, your mom's going to listen to this. And I want to call out that she has made some amazing strides in organizing her <laughs> Tupperware drawer. So well done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you feel good about it? Do you want the last word? I don't care. Do you have any other things to say? I don't care, but I don't want the last word. I'm okay, just happy I just want that we're to... working together. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, that was a nice tip. Thank you for that. Did you think I was going to have a mean tip? No, I okay. was just more... I, I was... I didn't want you to feel like I was like, okay, on to the next thing. I wanted you to feel oh, um, thanks. good. Because also, not to drag this out, but I feel like if the tables had turned in a somewhat of a past Nick, and I think some men do this in general is like you got, just got on, got on to me about not putting things back the exact right way. You would have said, but I just cleaned out all these other things and they're not really related to what you just said. So I didn't take that personally of you telling me that I needed to be more organized when I'm like, dude, I just organized our closet all by myself, all of our drawers by myself and the closet. So I just want you to keep that in mind of like, those are completely different things and yeah. they're not related. And just because you asked me about something else doesn't mean you don't appreciate the other things that I did. So just lock that one in. And to be clear, I don't think you're unorganized. Yeah. I just think you're super organized with the things that you have organized. <laughs> I think that I surprise people because I am very, I'd say meticulous and I remember specific details, but I'm like either super organized about something or just not organized about it. And maybe it's organized in my head, but it, it's just funny because I'm either like all the way one way or like all the way, like not I would all. agree with that one. The second <laughs> and, one. <laughs> and like, I think my handwriting surprises people too, because it's just like oh. not great. And my OB, who, you know, how the stereotype of like doctor's handwritings, um, just being a little uh, fast and scribbly, she's like, your bad handwriting makes me love you even more. So, you know, it just humanizes me. <laughs> you could have been a doctor or like who else has bad signatures? Notaries. You could have been so many other things. I still could be a notary. I don't know about being a doctor, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are about uh, 20 minutes into the episode. Now let's dig in and uh, start on what we were actually going to talk about today and just talking about it's going to be fine and like how do you know that it's going to be fine? <laughs> and it's going to sound like a very LA statement. And granted, we have been here for almost five years now. But basically, you attract what you think about and you attract what you say. And I've always heard it in like the negative, like if you <clears throat> think all these negative things about yourself and say these negative things about yourself and do negative things about yourself, then that's what's going to happen because you, you literally find what you're looking for and what you put out there. But only like recently did I really digest that like that also um, – goes for positive thinking too. And so one way that I implement it, it's like, I'm going to find a parking spot and it's going to be close. And you know what? 
I usually find a parking spot and it's close. And I'm not saying like I'm – I think the word people like to use is like manifest. And sure, that may be what it is. But it actually, if we want to dig deeper here, it actually can find its roots in the Bible. Um, and it, so I have like Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks within himself, so he is. Or if you want to go New King James Version, uh, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And I just think that that is so true. I think a lot of the things that people do and say of like in the woo-woo movement can actually be found like biblically, um, you know, my parents would say like growing up, like we, we don't listen to certain music or we don't watch certain movies because you're putting that in. Um, and that's what will end up coming out. And I think that that's, again, the same train of thought. To be clear about woo-woo, I think a lot of people would consider us to be woo-woo. So <laughs> maybe let's take the negative stigma away from that. But yeah, I'm I'm with you. No uh, negative stigma here, but it, I think it's what people would call it. If you're putting something in quotes and saying woo-woo, you're not oh. making a positive statement about it. <laughs> Um, right. And I think that some people would say that about that statement, not me. Yes, I understand. Um, this, that quote you referenced, not the Bible verse, but the quote of like, uh, what you look for, you will find. That's the way I hear it in my head. And the first time I heard it, which I don't think is where it came from, is, um, from a video sermon that Rob Bell did, uh, mm. like in the early 2000s called everything is spiritual. And, um, you know, it was talking about biblical concepts and spirituality, but the thing that the big thing I took away from it was what you look for, you will find. Um, and it was less that the things you look for will be revealed to you. There's a component of that, but it was more like you're actually able to paint on the canvas of your life based on your intention and what you are looking for. So it's more of a creation statement than it is a blindness statement, if that makes sense. I always, that resonated with me. Yeah. It also, I wonder if he referenced um, Luke eleven nine 9 in that, which I remember because it rhymes. Um, it's ask and it'll be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you, Luke eleven nine. 9. Yeah. So similar, similar thought there. The title of this, it's going to be fine is because, you know, sometimes we find ourselves saying that um, to ourselves, but then I'm also thinking um, in this topic of encompassing of like, Oh, if you have a friend or a partner or um, a child and they're like, I'm worried about this. And you're like, it's going to be fine. Just don't think about it. It's going to be fine. And that's some sort of like an invalidation. And so we don't want to do that specifically because I've been on the receiving end of it, but I've, I'm sure I've been on the other side of it too, where I'm giving it. Um, and I'm reading right now. I'm almost done. Um, I'm reading Untangled. And I say that because it was a, the book for book club and I it had about four chapters left and I hadn't finished it going into the book club, but it was fine because um, nobody had finished the book in book club. And the only other person who got further than me was only like two chapters further. One girl read the wrong book and the other one didn't read it at all. And so it's more of a camaraderie thing, <laughs> um, but untangled. It's good. It's about uh, raising teenage girls and kind of like how they operate. And so I'm seeing so much of myself in in the book and like, oh, that's why I did that. Or like, you're right. I didn't like that as a girl, a teenage girl. Um, and it talks about sometimes they just want to be heard. And Nick, you and I have had this discussion uh, before of like, sometimes I'm telling you something and I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to listen. Um, and it's more of like a venting sesh, but they talk about emotionally dumping in this book and how, you know, the child might go to the parent and this can be done in other relationships, but in this book is just about parents, um, and kids, but the child might go to the parent and say all this stuff that they're worried about. And then they're like, oh, and then like, they'll go to sleep at night. And then the mom will stay up all night and be worried about their child and like ask them about it like the next day or so. And they're like, oh yeah, I'm not thinking about that anymore. And it's actually like, a release, um, which I thought was interesting because I've never really like thought about it that way. And like, yep, I like to do that. I've definitely done that. <laughs> Sorry, Nick and mom. Sorry. I don't know uh, what the question was. Are you, um, there's no question. She just want to comment like, yeah, I do that or whatever. <laughs> you don't have to say that. There's so, no question. It's just like, do you have a comment on any of those thoughts? Do you, do, do you emotionally dump? I don't feel like you emotionally dump. I think I need to have those conversations more than you think I do, but I, my focus is typically typically on the solution. Uh, yeah. And I, I prefer to talk about the like objective why to frame the problem and then like talk about possible solutions and try and run towards one. 
Um, not to say that I don't like to sit in my emotions and my thoughts. Like I'm completely fine and comfortable with that, but I also do feel the drive to like, to fix. And I, I do have a pretty strong assumption that like everything is possible to get past and to be fixed. Um, not that I am able to be the one to fix it. That's a, that's a big distinction, but just that like, I am able to get past the problem that's in front of me somehow whether I think of the solution or not. So like, I like to focus on the solution. Um, but I think you'll probably like, I have no, if I know that you want to have the, like the dumping talk, you know, like the, that's a weird way to say that. Um, I know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you want to have a talk about something and not focus on the solution. Like, you know, that I will do that with you, but I'm typically not good at that unless I know that's what we're doing. Like my context yeah. has to be set. Or, or I will need to ask you, like, are you looking for this to be fixed? Like, are you want to, do you want to talk about solutions or do you just need to talk? And neither one is a wrong answer, but unless I know that I will focus on the solution. Yeah. And I think that part of my issue is like, I know what I'm thinking isn't correct or that they don't actually hate me or something along those lines. But if it was that easy for me to fix by myself, I would have already done it. And you, Nick, you um, or my mom, you, if I know what I need to do and what to say, but you telling me like, oh, they don't hate you or like, this is what you should do to like get over that feeling is not actually, it's not that it's not helpful. It's that like, it, that doesn't help me overcome it and get over it. There's like, sometimes it's just a time thing or, um, I don't know, again, maybe I just need to get it out of my system and just have a good, um, vent and let it all out. <laughs> um, but I generally know what I need to do, but it's, it's harder than just knowing that what I need to do. Can I challenge that for a second? Sure. Sure. This is, I'm guessing here and this is my perception. I disagree. Okay. With, never mind. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. I disagree with your statement that you know what you're speaking is true and what you're speaking is false. And I'm not saying that you're screwing up. I'm saying that Sometimes you cast feelings and thoughts on people that you believe to be true, specifically negative ones, and you don't know them to be false and know that you're wrong in saying them out loud. For example, if somebody doesn't give you a gift or something, or like doesn't remember a specific event in your life, or doesn't reach out to you as you expected them to, you usually will say things like, oh, like, I've done so much. Why don't they care about me? Or why don't they like me? Or I know they don't want me in their friend group. Or like, I don't think that all of those thoughts are known to you as like out there and not true. Yeah, no, you're right. And I think even just saying them out loud, it could have a weight of like, this feels true. And that's why you have to be so careful who you're talking to um, and who's like pouring into your life because they could be like, yeah, that's true. And then you go down to like a spiral. I know you're not going to say that to me, Nick, but like, I don't know. It just sometimes feels real and I just need a minute to like process it. Um, I do find ways to try and say that to you. Yeah. Yeah. I do. It is. I, I think I've moved slowly when it comes to feelings and usually they're, they're rooted in other things. Um, they're rooted in other issues probably that have happened whenever I think like, oh, someone hates me, which honestly, if we're being real, like that's a, <laughs> that's like a thought I have all the time of like, oh, they don't like me or I'm not good enough or I'm not cool enough or. Um, I mean, a lot of, that's a lot of, I'm not saying you're, you're saying it's only you, but just so people know, like that's a lot of people's feeling, not yeah. about you, about themselves. Right. And that's why I think I said it is because like. I don't know, the devil <laughs> wants you to think that you're the only one. <laughs> um, and that's like a whole like, again, that's a whole like spiral that you can have, like why it's important. That's why I do think it's important to say things out loud or write it down if you don't have someone to say it to just to like get it out of your head and stop it living there. Now, if you keep saying it to yourself, that's another issue. But I do think like emotionally dumping, whether it be, um, I don't know, record, say it out loud and record yourself <laughs> saying it and then just like delete it. And like, that's you like, throwing it away, um, you know, put it on a piece of paper, burn it, you know, um, there are things to do there. Um, but you're not alone. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, 
So it makes perfect sense to me how to draw the line between solutioning and talking, mm -hmm. right? And I think I've gotten better at that. I'm not trying to ask for a compliment, but the, but the thing that's fuzzier for me is how do I combat the statements that come out of your mouth that are just categorically false and I know are holding you down without you thinking I'm not on your side or trying to go to solutioning. As an example, if somebody doesn't get back to you about an event or something that you expected them to, and you say like something- These are all like, hypothetical things, they, by the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm just saying that. It's all hypothetical. If you're like, if you're listening like, hmm, are they talking about me? No, these are all hypothetical. Keep going. <laughs> but if you're listening and thinking, is it me? It is you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You're so like- You're so vain. You probably think this podcast is about you. Keep going. <laughs> wow. Um, if you say something like, hey, like you're venting to me, right? And I know we're not solutioning, but I'm listening to you and I'm happy to talk to you. And you say something like, I knew they hated me or I knew they don't consider me. In my mind, just sitting there and letting that sit and not responding to it allows you to marinate in it and it has a worse negative effect to you, the person that I love, than it would if I try and help speak some truth into you. And it's not that I know those statements to be false, but they're hyperbolic in the moment when you're feeling hurt. And whether you know that you're being hyperbolic or not, I would prefer those to not be there. So like, for example, when I, I usually respond to you by saying like, hey, I understand you're hurting from what happened, but that doesn't mean this person hates you. You typically don't take that well, not to criticize you, but like you, you see that as you've communicated this to me before, not being on your side. And what I'm trying to do is be objective, actually in defense of you, not in defense of the other person, because I don't want you to sit with those negative thoughts and feelings, most of which are probably hyperbolic and not true and can really eat you up. Yeah, I I get what you're saying and I think what's hard is in the moment it feels like you're taking the other person's side and that like they couldn't possibly mean that and just as a caveat here, I think it's really hard for guys to know the meanness that exists between girls. Girls can be incredibly mean and it will just go over the guy's head. And so I guess I hear what you're saying, but it, it just feels like and you say like, no, they don't. That's taking their side and being like, what you're feeling isn't real. And it, and I understand like in some cases it is like, you know, uh, extrapolation of the of the mind. But in some cases it, it's not. And it's like an, a specific example of why this was mean. And so I think what I would prefer is like, I'm sorry you're feeling that way. I love you and I would never do – like make it about you because obviously for the most part – and I say for the most part because even sometimes between us – I would be like, why would you do that? That was hurtful. And it's not even like you didn't even do it personally type of thing. So I think what I would appreciate is just to make it about things that you know to be true, which would make it between you and I, not me and this other person or whatever. Does that make sense? It makes sense, but I don't agree. Respectfully, I don't agree. Like uh, you, before I brought this question up, you said on this podcast I know what I'm saying isn't true. And I know you're talking about the same statements that I'm trying to combat. So like, you know that if you say somebody hates you 80% of the time, 90% of the time, it's not true and it's hyperbolic, right? So why would you want your partner to let you go down that spiral is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And I think what's why you, I think you hear me like saying one thing and doing another is I'm just thinking about like real life examples that we've done. And I think there's only a handful of people who I feel like that statement is true about. Um, and the rest I know that I'm kind of like fabricating in my mind and it's just like my mind against me. Whereas I'm like, no, every example that I ever have from, from whoever is like, yeah, they don't prefer uh, me to be around. And yeah. I think- I think that's where it's a little bit hard is I'm like crisscrossing like our real life here, here right now in the statement. And I think there's a difference between like fabricating and just, you know, having not, not communicating with somebody and then like people actually being like hurtful and toxic. And so that's probably why you hear me back and forth. Cause like, I know for the most part, 
when I'm like, okay, no, I know it's hard for me to think right now, but I don't think they like me or they prefer to be around other people when I don't really have a ton of examples to support that. And then I have other ones where like I do have examples to support it. But I also hear like you're so good about being specific with words and you like don't like to even say like malicious or like hurtful things when emotionally dumping, um, which I, I do appreciate that. And I think words are so important. I think I don't, I don't know how to say this and and make it sound like I'm not trying to be mean to you because I'm really not. But like I feel like you in this podcast are the perfect opposite to your own argument. Like <laughs> you have said like you know the things you're saying aren't true. You've also we started this podcast by saying what you look for you will find. Yeah. And what we didn't say but it's pretty obvious is that we should look for and search for positivity and joy and support and comfort. You know, and like, so to me, just putting it out there that like you think somebody doesn't consider you or hates you or doesn't want you around or like, I understand you may be feeling that way and I'm in no way saying let's suppress your feelings. But like if our kids came to us and said like, Alice did this to me again, I don't understand why she hates me. I don't think either of us would let that comment sit in defense of her being able to vent. I think what I would try to do based on like what I prefer, I'd see what she wanted me to do first of all, but I would try to build her up and think, say what I say, what I know to be true about her and like yes. lift her up in that say. And I think we'll I see this, that as the priority. I, yeah. I'm sorry. And, and we can cut this. But as far as like, um, you know, there was even an example last year where like I was sad and you were like, you noticed it maybe 30 minutes later and I didn't say anything about it. And you're like, why are you sad? And I was like, you didn't notice that. And it was like something that had occurred. And you were like, I know I'm being vague, but it's, I'm being vague on purpose, purpose for this podcast. Yeah, um, and I you were like, oh, I didn't even notice that. I'm so sorry. Like that is hurtful. That was a perfect way. Like acknowledging that it did happen. It was hurtful. It was just kind of like icing on the cake really for um, some other issues and stuff that had gone on. Um, and I think that's where you're hearing me deviate from what I'm suggesting people to do is because there are certain examples where I'm like, that is hurtful. And then you, you as a NICU took a while to see that that was hurtful, that hurtful things were happening. Yeah. I understand what you're saying, but, but it sounds like what you're saying is sometimes I, Lauren am right about these hyperbolic statements. So don't challenge any of them. And like, I, I fully acknowledge that I can be blind to something that you see, even something negative. That situation you just referenced is a prime example. I didn't see that. And now it's become a little more clear to me, as sad as it is, it's more clear. And I am I more understand why you have felt the way you have felt about that situation. Yeah. But your point is also that that's an anomaly. So like, I don't agree that I should always just let those statements sit. And, yeah. and, and to be clear, I'm not saying I should be like, Hey, shut up. You're wrong. Like, don't say you think that person hates you. Like how okay. dare Like, that's not it. My, what I would like to say in those, in those moments is, and what I try to say, which maybe I'm not good at it is like, I understand you're feeling hurt. This to me doesn't feel like what you just communicated to me. Yeah. You know what it's I mean? More, it's more of like a trust but verify situation, but also it's making me think of, I just listened to, I forgot the episode number, but I listened to Haven, the podcast interview with Erwin Raphael McManus. And there's a part in it um, where he, t it's called like, what's in a name? I'll link it in the show notes. Um, but he talks about there are certain like painful parts in his life when I have not experienced as much pain as he's experienced. So I'm not even going there. But he was like, there are certain examples in my life where it was very painful for me and I would just keep reliving them because your brain starts to to, um, even if it didn't happen a certain way, which it did, um, it will keep remembering and remembering. And then even the good parts you like filter out, but he's had to retrain his memory around the day and like figure out like what was actually like good that day. Or, um, basically think about it in a way where he's not marinating in like 
the bad things that happened to where he can feel hear about a certain time or feel something and it doesn't even like phase him per se. And so I think that's what you have to do or I have to do rather in like those certain situations because they're still painful to me because like, I don't know, I'm still in the process of trying to read the body keeps the score, um, but like we hold things in our body which again sounds woo woo, but we do. <laughs> and, um, I think that's just something like I personally have to work on because I hold on to it. And because my memory is so like spot on, unfortunately, unfortunately I remember it and I marinate on it. And so I think that's where it, it differs as well. Yeah. And it, like we're, we're talking about the situations where, like the way you prefer to process these kinds of things. I don't want to discount, like I have these feelings too, you know? So I'm not, I'm not over here on my righteous high horse of like, Oh, I never think that anybody's negative towards me ever. And like, you know, that's, I feel like you think that about me sometimes it's, it's not that I don't have those thoughts. It's that I try to push them out actively. And I would prefer not to say this is right or wrong. I'm all the way on the other side of the, uh, of the spectrum where I would prefer for somebody to be like standing in front of me, telling me they don't want me around, then I'll believe them. You know what I mean? Like I, I need that to know that somebody isn't for me. And I realize that that's not super cautious because it means everybody up until that point, most people don't get to that point. Everybody up until that point is with me, you know, and is a friend and does care about me. You know, I realize there's dangers in that approach as well, but I think that way that I live is uncomfortable when compared to you being on the other side of the spectrum, because like the benefits of my perspective there is that it allows me to see all the things that do prove that the people you're doubting do care about you and do love you. And because I'm looking for those things for everybody, including you. And I think that your brain trains you a bit to look for the other things in defense of yourself. Again, not to say it's right or wrong, but we have seen situations where you're blind to those things, the positive things, and then it like reaffirms the narrative you have of your hyperbolic statements of they don't want me around, they hate me, they must yeah. not care about me. You know what I mean? So like I that and that gets all the way back to my question. It's not I understand the difference between solutioning and, and talking and venting. But how would you prefer that I hold space for you when you may know that you're being hyperbolic and also like guard against the things that are coming into your heart and mind that are tearing you down? That's how I see it as I see it as defending you, not telling you that you're wrong. That's not the point. It's like, I feel like these swords are being thrown at you in the way of like in the form of your words yeah. and, and you're telling me not to stand there as your husband with the shield and protect you against those things that are eating you. Yeah. And I think, again, there are some times where I'm like, it's hurtful or someone has done something actually specifically hurtful and you're like, they didn't mean it. Or like, um, that's not true. Um, and it like actually happened and it's, it's hurtful. So it does feel like you're taking their side. I think something that we have both gotten better about is I'll say like, I don't expect you to like solution this. I just need to get it out. Or you'll ask me, uh, what do you want me to say here? Um, and like, are you, what are you looking for here? And I think that's it. It was just like asking, like, kind of like, what are you looking for in this moment? If I don't specify, um, it may not be very, I don't know, sexy to ask, like, what do you want me to say here? But it's, I think it's the expectation there of like, what you're, I don't know. When you ask, you know, you get the answer. Okay, but your answer is still with respect to solutioning versus talking. And what I'm saying is if I know, both of us know we're in talking venting stage and you say, I think this person hates me, you would prefer A, I sit there and let that, let that sit and let you continue or B, do what? That's my question. Say, I would say like, I don't, if you think that that's not true and it's not one of these anomaly situations where it's like there are actual examples, be like... I don't think that's true. Like think about all the things that you are like, you're a good friend. You're like, speak things that you know to be true about me because it's, it's not really, I'm doubting the other person. I'm doubting myself at the moment. It's related in a insecurity in me. And so I would speak life to me about me. Okay. I hear you there because what I typically jump to is assuming you already have that confidence about yourself and defending the actions of the other person that are, I, I see now why you're thinking that I'm on their side. Cause like 
what I'm typically trying to do is affirm that they care about you. So I'm saying things they have done that I see that are positive and show that they care about you. But what you're hearing is, oh, he's defending them instead of me. Yeah. Yeah. Or it feels like an invalidation, which is one of the types of a negative communication style. Yeah. If you're um, unfamiliar with those, it's like invalidation, escalation. <laughs> Let me Google the Google the others real quick. Uh, I don't know the word for it, but it's leaving, right? Invalidation, escalation. Uh, yeah, withdraw. Withdraw. I don't know. <laughs> They're not the we same should, words I'm used to. We should... Criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. Like said, shutting down. Um, anyway. We'll, we'll put them in the notes, yeah. I'm sure you will. We are entering upon summer travel season and we are partaking in that. And something that I am not messing around with this summer is my beauty routine. And my favorite beauty add-on right now is my Omnilux LED mask. I actually travel with their full mask, but if you want to try something smaller or um, just don't want to travel with a larger thing to begin with, um, they have a smaller option like a mini that is really cute and just sticks on your face with a sticker. But either one, you can use code. Well, actually, I'm not going to tell you the code here. The code will be in the show notes along with a link. So you're going to click on the link and use the code that I put in the show notes and you'll have a discount on your LED mask. LED is all the rage, but I'm telling you it lives up to the hype. And I would highly recommend it if you're looking a way to level up your skincare routine that's actually manageable to do every day and yield results. All that to say, I think words are so important and I'm thankful that you kind of like catch that. Um, but to challenge you, um, like you are, like you already said, you're so positive. Um, and I'd say that's mostly a good thing. Um, I think why we balance each other out as our acupuncturist says, he's the sun and I'm the moon. Uh, but I think words affect you more than you think they do, even though like you are more positive. I think you do have like internal um, internal things, whether it be, you know, you didn't like yourself in, I don't know if someone said it to you, but like until a couple years ago, you never wore short sleeve shirts and you never wore t-shirts. Um, and you didn't wear hats. I think someone told you you didn't look good in hats. Um, and you internalize that. You also think you don't have a good singing voice, but I think you have a good singing voice. And it's because someone told you that it wasn't a good singing voice. So all that to say, Words matter and they matter what you say to yourself as much as to other people. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think I, I said that earlier in the podcast as well. And I agree with you. Like the, it's not that I don't have the thoughts that you have or that the words don't sit with me, whether they're positive or negative. Um, and they do affect me. I think my outlook though is rooted in, I would prefer to be surprised by a negative than I would to be surprised by a positive. And I'm like on the defense. Right. <laughs> and, and again, I know that that's a less cautious way to live life, the way that I'm referring to myself. Um, you know, it's possible that that means I don't see danger as quickly as you see danger, uh, or I don't see someone who may not be on my side as quickly as you might. But again, I would prefer for them not wanting to be around me or not liking me or being offended by me or being a dangerous threat to me. I would prefer that to be a surprise to me. You know, cause like, I think that allows me to hold most of my headspace and intention around the positive that I see and rarely be affected by the negative, which gets to the anxiety and fear thing. Like, it's not that I don't have anxiety and fear. I do, but I don't think that I am paralyzed by it, for lack of a better term, in the same way that you are. Yeah. I, I need to find the message because there is a message, I think, that Erwin did on that as well. Like, when you think good things are going to happen um, or go in expecting good things or good experiences, that's typically what you get. Not to say you won't ever experience hardship, but he like give, gave the example of traveling and just expecting people are going to be nice uh, and kind and generous and obviously keep your wits about you. But if you're like, oh, I'm going to be on the edge of 
my seat, like making sure no one takes advantage of me and things like that. Like you're generally going to be looking for that and um, that's shaping your your trip. So again, I'm not saying just think happy thoughts and you're there, but <laughs> put in the work and just think that the best of people and generally speaking, that's what's going to happen. Can you give us your philosophy on uh, table vendors in other countries? <laughs> Just, just as a follow up to what you just said, I want. I'm curious. I don't think bad things are going to happen with table vendors. I just don't want to get their hopes up, hopes up that I'm going to purchase something, and so I don't typically make eye contact if I'm not interested in buying things. And I'm going to keep walking past. I'll say no, thank you, or whatever. But I'm not going to stop at every. Th- Usually, we're going somewhere. We don't typically take trips that are like, oh, let me leisurely do this. It's like, I want to see this and we're packing in our days and I don't have time unless I just like want to look at what they have. I generally don't want what they have um, and I don't want to get their hopes up. And so I just, I'm like, just keep going, Nick. We don't need to talk to everybody. They're going to think that you want to buy something. Wow. Hold on. Hold on. (laughs) Is it possible that you have some anxiety around whether they will be mad at you or hate you because you've looked at their merchandise and not purchased? It's not even it's not even like that. Like I'm not treating them like not like a human. It's just like I know it's a very – not I know. I can assume that it is a hard – it's hard work and it's a lot of work. And um, I just don't want them to think that they're going to get a sale and they don't. So, yeah, I, I, honestly, <laughs> I care too much about things and I am constantly like thinking about what other people think. Uh, and I think I lean empath. And so a lot of my worry and anxiety is because I care. And sometimes I wish I didn't care as much. <laughs> One would say you care about how much you care. Yeah. I I know about you that you don't want to stop at the table vendors because you don't want to get their hopes up and it is in defense of them. They don't know that about you. So when they see somebody who refuses to make eye contact with them and won't even look at the merchandise on their table, I wonder if they feel the same support that you're trying to provide. I hear you. I, I just don't. <laughs> also, plenty of vendors here that have actual storefronts are struggling to pay their people and struggling to pay themselves. And I feel bad going in and not buying anything. But you do. I feel go bad in. with solicitors like wanting to sell something on my doorstep, and I'm like, I can't buy anything from you. I feel bad about that. <laughs> I feel like you're yelling at me when I'm agreeing with you that you are sweet and considering others. The only thing I'm challenging is the way that you're showing it may come off the opposite way to them. Yeah, well, Nick tells me to smile more. Not smile more. No, I do not tell you to smile more. You don't – sorry, I know it sounds bad the way I said it, but (laughs) whenever we're taking photos or whatever, you're like, I need you to smile or whatever. Just because I don't know that I have like true RBF, but sometimes I have RBF, so. I think you have RAF, resting anxiety face. Maybe. Honestly, Maybe. you're usually thinking about when you're posing for a photo or about to, you're usually thinking about what's going to look bad in this. Am I looking okay in this? Like you're typically, you're in a negative spiral and I have to be like, Hey, shoulders back. Give me a smile. You look cute. Mm. This is great. Mm. Um, I do not ever say to you, smile I know. more. Ever. You don't. You don't. Sorry that, that that sounded bad. He doesn't say that. I may or may not have had to take somebody out for saying that to you. I know. We're not going to talk about that here. That can be another another topic for another day. Um, someone told me that whenever we were in New York. Anyway, uh, something I kind of wanted to mention here is uh, postpartum anxiety. And I don't know that I ever thought that I suffered from it. I mean, there were like definitely highs and lows in that like newborn phase, but it doesn't just develop in the newborn phase. Oftentimes it will develop after the newborn phase. Um, so after the first three months. And so just to keep that in mind, and I, looking back, I think I did have some like postpartum anxiety, but again, like I was used to people who had that being like, oh, I can't cut things in the kitchen because I'm afraid I'm going to drop my knife and like hurt my child. Like, it was never like that for me. Um, I don't even know how to describe it, but I just wanted to say it in case you are suffering from that or you know somebody who's suffering from that. Um, I mean, I I remember at least one anxiety attack, and Nick, you weren't here for that. Um, you you were 
it was in February because you're actually getting my Valentine's present. I was like, I need you to come back right now. And I was just in the fetal position on our bed and we still had Dino, which I don't know if we've addressed here, but our dog um, passed away. Um, and he was on the bed with me. Uh, and just like the best <laughs> emotional support animal with that. But I just like couldn't, couldn't move. Um, Dino yeah. was not allowed on the bed and that day he was welcomed. Yes, he was welcomed. You brought up postpartum depression and anxiety. I think you're specifically talking about anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. um, are you suggesting any different way to deal with that than what we've already talked about um, in focusing on the positive? Uh, I mean, yeah, definitely uh, get help. Doctors exist for a reason. Um, and if you are feeling off or if you notice someone is off, definitely bring it up because sometimes we can't see it ourselves. Um, talk to somebody and then there's always, you know, let's not make a taboo. There's medication that you can take that um, sometimes like you need to take that. So there's no shame in that. Uh, something that can you be specific about get help. What are you specifically? Referring see a doctor. To? I already said see a doctor. No, no, I know, but there's millions of different types of doctors. I'm asking you what kind of help you're referring to. Are you saying go to your OB and communicate it there? Are you saying well, go to a therapist or get a therapist? What are you specifically All of the to? above. I'm not a doctor and I cannot give medical advice. However, I would say talk to your OB. I'm lucky enough to have an OB who is extremely caring and, you know, always I felt like did more than screening and like asking me how I was doing. And there are things I think that she asks um, to kind of gauge how you are, you know, earlier in January, she asked me a question and I just ended up sobbing in her office. Um, and I think, um, that's a great avenue to go and they can often refer you to, you to people. Um, and yeah, see a therapist, um, all of the above. I, I don't really know what your situation is. Um, and so I, I don't want to say like, just do this. So I think I would seek professional help. I'm not trying to be exclusive. I'm you've yeah. done it. I was saying give an ex like a, an inclusive list and obviously there are other avenues. Something that you have said and that is significant to me from your OB as well is um the people who should get help are not limited to those without supportive partners. Yeah. Yeah. So said in a different way, Lauren, you probably could have gotten other types of help and yeah. not to be prideful, but like I feel like I was trying to show up as a supportive partner. Yeah. And there were plenty of things I still didn't understand and wasn't sufficient in helping you with. Yeah. So get help regardless of your situation. Yeah. And um, I think another thing is just like, it sounds silly, but gratitude, which we talked about before, is just the act of gratitude can chemically like change the chemical balance of your brain. Um, so that's always good, whether it's like saying it out loud or like I often, you can, you can pray, but even like in moments where you're feeling bad or in moments you recognize like, oh, I'm so glad I have air conditioning. Like, thank you for air conditioning, that type of thing, you know, in the moment of like when you realize like, oh yeah. Um, and, and once you start noticing these things, then you will notice more and more. And so I think it just creates a gratitude practice. Some people gratitude journal. Um, kind of what we were talking about in this episode of like, if you think good things, like that is what you will seek and often what you will find um, like truly think it's going to be good. I'm going to find that parking spot. Like I'm going to get through today. I'm going to feel rested someday. Uh, and then another trick I use is, I don't know if you've heard of box breathing, but you're in for four, you breathe in for four, hold for four, out for four, hold for four. And so oftentimes they'll tell you like draw a square on your leg. And I kind of like to do what I call What's the five? Is it Pentagon? The five-sided one? Um, pentagon breathing, but I'm not doing a pentagon. I literally just have my fingers. And so I like will count one, two, three, four, five. Um, and so I'll just like hold for five and then go out for five and hold for five. And I'm just doing the seconds or whatever on my hand. And that's oftentimes how I'll fall asleep. And like Nick and I I don't know. People either touch when they sleep or don't don't touch when they sleep. And we touch when we're asleep. And so sometimes I'll find myself like doing this on him and he'll like shake my hand like, what are you doing? But that's what I'm doing. It's it's a calming, like relaxing technique. Um, we, could, we could call it five finger breathing, I guess, instead of Pentagon. But that's my variation on box breath. <laughs> yeah. Um, overall, I don't know. Just know you're not alone. Um, that's what we stand for here at Boy Girl Mom is where you're not alone unless you want to be. And I think in this case, uh, 
you don't want to be alone with your thoughts and you shouldn't be. I think the other thing I wanted to talk about with this episode of just like, again, postpartum anxiety isn't just in the quote postpartum period, end quote. Um, I feel like almost more anxious. I guess it's anxious about different things than as a newborn, but I feel almost more anxious now as a toddler parent, whether it be from them like deciding to jump off of things or just being able to get my own things done. And so oftentimes I will experience, I'll come out of a chaotic day or chaotic morning and I have like three hours with our nanny. We have a nanny who comes three times a week for three hours each day ish. Um, And so that's nine hours, but I'm usually coming out of the morning and it's, you know, sometimes I'm overstimulated. Nick will go to the gym. And so like, it's me and them all morning. And, um, I come out of it, whether it's in the morning when our nanny gets here or at night after they go to bed, I'm like, I don't even know what to do. I don't know where to begin. Where do I start? Do I check my email? Do I go do like my personal work that I need to do? Do I clean the kitchen? Because that's going to affect me. Do I work on research for upcoming projects? It's like, I don't even know what to do. And then now I'm just going to sit here and doom scroll. And so I think anxiety presents itself in different ways. Um, My sister and I also talk a lot about being paralyzed and not being able to do things. Like you have so many things, the weight is so heavy on you that you're like, okay, I can't do anything now and I'm just going to sit here until it passes. And (laughs) then you're like, cool, I don't have anything done that I was going to get done. But if I don't take a break, my body will then, it's already basically telling you at that point that it's time to take a break. But um, I think there are different ways anxiety looks. Well, I will say one thing that I like to do is to help or combat that. One thing I like to do to combat that type of anxiety is just do things, um, not doom scroll because then I'm like, why am I even looking at TikTok? I don't even want to see this and I don't care. So I'll often go do something like physical, like with my hands, not having to look at a computer that I need to do. So for example, clean out the closet or, um, you know, take out the trash that gets me outside. I think that helps too. Um, I like to listen to music. You can get into our tiff of (laughs) new music or old shows, um, from last week, episode 40. Was that last week? No, it's two back episode 44. Episode 44, you can go um, and listen to that. But speaking of new music, one song I did want to mention is by our friend Raya. She just came out with a song, Bed, and literally the premise of it is like being so anxious and like uh, things that you have to do are piling up, and but you can't get out of bed to even do it. So um, I think that also helps you feel like you're not alone um, and you get alone with your thoughts. That's like, that's like a bad, big, bad deep dive that is sometimes just hard to get out of. But Nick, I have a question for you. Or do you have a comment on that? No, I actually, I have, this is going to sound inappropriate, but I promise it's appropriate. I got a text message from somebody right as we were starting this podcast that said, what are you doing today? Mm-hmm. And we're recording this on Memorial Day. Mm-hmm. And he's joking, but his follow-on message after an hour is, or you can just tell me you hate me. <laughs> <laughs> and I know this person's humor and he's completely kidding. But it is funny to me that this episode on this day is when that (laughs) message came in. And it does prove this is a guy. We have those thoughts. And humor is one of the ways that we push them off as, hey, this is a ridiculous thought. So just bringing that up. If you're that person, I'm going to respond to you as soon as we're done recording. (laughs) And I don't hate you. And honestly, about that is like I used to be a person that like responded to text messages in a timely manner. It's just hard for me now because that also weighs me down of like, uh, I don't even want to be on my phone. I see it. I'm sorry. Um, and I have to do it in batches now. And so I think again, anxiety can change like as you, um, age and go in and out of seasons of life. So Nick, anyway, on that, what you just said, I have a question. I literally wrote down as someone who doesn't stress out a lot, how do you do this? I think that you've answered a little bit, but you have a generic, like, this is how I don't stress out or some practices people can put into place to not stress out as much? Um, I think I over-index on gratitude a little bit. Like I see so clearly the giant list of things that are positive in my life, um, not as a comparison mechanism, but just as a reassurance that I'm doing much better than I feel like I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So it's not that, and I think you believe this about me, I am not blind to the stress and the anxiety and the risks. I believe that you're blind to those things. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. I think that at times you very much think I don't see any danger or any bad. 
like specifically any negativity. I think that you you don't think I see any negativity. And that's not true. I see it, but I prefer to focus like violently on the positive. You know? So like my brain, this is what happens in my brain. I frequently have the thought, I'm frustrated we don't have a house of our own yet. Like multiple times a day I have that thought. And the quick things that I jump to are we make X amount of money that's more than 90 whatever percent of the world. We live in a beautiful place. We have a wonderful amount of space that even though it feels a little bit cramped is much more than most people have. We have an amazing group of friends. We have very supportive family members. Like my brain does that without almost any effort right now. And it's, I think it's because I have trained it to do that, but like, that's my mechanism. And it's, again, it's not a comparison tool. It's a, I almost jump quickly into the gratitude of like, oh, I see you negative thought. You're wrong. Be gone thought. Yeah, honestly, honestly. And it's like, it is not it doesn't remove the frustration and sadness and stress I have from not having said thing or not being said thing yet, or not being a specific career place or not being the type of father I want to be, or not being, being the type of partner I want to be. Those things don't go away, but they, I think I try to see them with their appropriate weight when they're compared next to the giant list of amazing that is around me. And, and we are very, very privileged and in a very beautiful place in our life. So I see that like as a quick pivot to negative thoughts. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And true or false, you generally have the idea that it's going to be fine and it's all going to work out. I have absolutely zero evidence to the contrary. So the, so the, the answer is yes. Even the worst things that have happened to me, all work out for good every single time. And, and and this is like a logic thing for me. If that weren't true, the previous point wouldn't be true either. Do you think that relates do you see, to- Hold on, sorry. sorry. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like I wouldn't be able to build a giant list of positives if it wasn't also true that I am able to get through everything that's in front of me in life. Yeah. Do you think that is related to your faith at all? Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I I thought the answer would be yes, so I'm glad that I had the right answer because um, that would make me anxious if I didn't. Uh, but I think back to <laughs> the twins. I don't know what else it could be. <laughs> the twins' first birthday, and it was just an insane year as far as like what went on in our family. There was just a lot of things going on, and so I didn't have as much time for like planning that I normally like plan out parties and things like that. And I remember you saying afterwards, like, see, like it all worked out. It's fine. Like obviously not negating the work that I put in for it, but it was closer to the deadline of the party than I wanted it to be. And like, yeah, sure. I couldn't find certain cookie cutters. And I think there were a couple other things, but yeah, it all was fine. And it was a good time. And generally speaking, I wouldn't redo any of it because I liked exactly how it was. So Again, that's also kind of putting the focus on like the positive on like what went right versus like what I didn't get to do. And if I were to just sit and muddle in like the has been's or has nots or didn't happen, then that's what I would feel. And I don't feel that way about that um, about that time. But there there are obviously things that I wanted that I didn't get to. Uh, and then we've also told the doctor's appointment story on a different episode where I was anxious because I was trying to get my doctor's appointment on time and they tell you to be there 15 minutes early. And I was like, now I'm right on time and I need to find parking and I can't find anything. And so like I had circled around and didn't realize how far I had gone backwards. And I'm like, well, I can't park this far. I can't even jog there and get on time. But then I was like, hey, Nick, we're here. <laughs> you tell me it's going to be fine. And I think like I just struggle to live in the gray because growing up as a kid, they tell you like, this is right and this is wrong when really there's a lot of gray. And I'm not talking about like illegal things here. I'm just talking about like, I have a problem of being able to say like, this doesn't have to be just like this and so rigid. And like, they say be there 15 minutes early because oftentimes people are late. And by telling them that they're getting there on time and I'm not a bad person and they're not going to be mad at me for being there late because that's what went through my head. That's exactly what went through my head. And I was like, reframe, reframe. And it was fine. They weren't even mean to me that I was like five minutes late. It was all fine. 
Yeah. Do you remember the question I randomly asked you the other day about how afraid you are of something? Yeah. I'll repeat it here. I said, <laughs> how afraid are you in your adult life of being in trouble? And it didn't really spark that big of a conversation, but like, I think that you're frequently afraid of being in trouble. I think you're frequently afraid of missing the expectations that others have on you and your own expectation of, of doing the right thing always. Yeah. And I, not a point of criticism. It's just, I think that speaks to the same like anxiety you're referring to in this episode is you focus on the shortcomings and you don't focus on the positives. You know, and what's funny to me is like you give more grace to other people that fall short than most humans do to you. And and yet you're still way more critical of yourself, you know, not meeting the 15 minutes early for an appointment deadline you know, that nobody else is probably thinking about. Yeah. People I see like once a year and I'm also incredibly nice <laughs> when I see them. So like, <laughs> yeah. It yeah. makes me think of we had this um, routine, a chair routine, which is literally just in, in dance in high school. Um, you like dance with a chair. It sounds not what it is, but <laughs> it was a cute song that is an older song. It's um, the lyrics that I'm thinking about are you have to accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative and don't wet, don't mess and don't mess with Mr. In Between. Focus on the good. Don't think about the bad. Like let it pass, and don't don't muddle in the middle, which I think is what I do often. Yeah, and you, I didn't fully answer this question. Um, I think a lot of my positivity is rooted in my faith. Um, the list that I referred to of things that are are blessings or things to be like uh, gracious about, things that I have on my gratitude list. They come from me thinking, how does God see me? Mm. And I believe that God sees me through the lens of Christ and only sees the good. So if he's not focusing on what I think are shortcomings, mistakes, or offenses that I've done to others or something, then why would I have them on the list of things I would think about and consider? Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Yeah, such a good point. I really don't think we can end on anything better than that. Than that. Um, so thank you so much for listening with us today. We're so glad we can grow with you and have these types of conversations. Go forth and look at positive things. <laughs> and stop by vendors' tables and see if you want to buy something and know that they appreciate it. Mm -hmm. That was for, I think Lauren wanted to say that, but I said Yeah, uh -huh. bye. See you next week. <laughs> Like my mom and dad. Gotta wash those butts together. It's a trip, but we'll guide you through with tips and tricks for boys and girls, too.